Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, could everyone check their microphone? Someone was uh, uh, not muted before, so just make sure they're all off. Uh, a few people could send me a message just to make sure everything's uh, good. We'll get started. All right, uh, great. So recording is started today. Uh, today we have two more days of uh, magnetic fields and forces related material. Uh, so we're gonna kind of finish this up today and then uh, next week in the few days in week 15, we will uh, finish with some uh, topics from modern physics. So two more days of magnetism before we move on. Uh, the home, this was originally supposed to be, uh, part of Monday's class. Uh, so I've just kind of moved everything by a day. You will see that there is a, uh, the homework that was listed for Monday is now listed for today. So there is no homework Monday and hopefully, uh, hopefully by tomorrow I should have the exam grades back. So if you're waiting on those, they, they will be with you shortly. Uh, so, uh, the other thing you can expect before we start the class is I think we're going to do one more lab, uh, online lab next week, uh, leaving, that would lead us to have, uh, nine labs total. So one more lab, uh, and, uh, two more weeks of, uh, problem sets. So, all right. Today, uh, as far as the physics is concerned, uh, over the past few classes, we've talked a lot about magnetic fields and how, magnet, how we create magnetic fields from currents and how we see them in nature. But now what we want to talk about is specifically the magnetic force and the force caused by these fields and what that looks like. As we know from electricity, electric forces are and fields are slightly different. The field is the thing in space that causes the force. And the force can be, for an electric field, the force can be parallel to the field if you have a positive charge. And the force can be uh, opposite the field if you have a negative charge. So for an electric force and field, they're always parallel, but the exact direction, whether they're parallel or anti-parallel, you can say, depends on the charge. As we'll see, the magnetic force direction also depends on the charge. It also depends on how the charge is moving. And it's a bit more complicated uh, because we know there's this 3D nature to all magnetic forces. You can't really draw it in two dimensions. So today we're gonna see what that looks like. So uh, just to summarize what we know experimentally is magnetic fields, when they exist in space, exert forces on a moving charge or a current. So it's only moving charges that feel this force. And the new experimental fact for today is that the force has to be perpendicular to both the magnetic field and the velocity vector. So this diagram drawn on the page here kind of shows you what that's like. So we have magnetic field and velocity forming a page. Magnetic field is blue, velocity is green. And as long as the charge is moving in this magnetic field, it'll feel a force. But the force needs to point in a direction, so it's going to be perpendicular to both of those. That means it has to point out of the plane, like shown here. There's no other way that the force can be perpendicular to both the magnetic field vector B, uh, B is in boy, and the velocity vector V. So this is the experimental fact we have to relate. It's this, uh, uh, it's this fact that the force is perpendicular to the field that causes compass needles to rotate. Eventually, uh, the moving charges, the spins of the electrons inside the iron magnetized compass needle, eventually align so that the spins are parallel to the field but that means the charges are actually are spinning, quote unquote, perpendicular to the field. So uh, this net force rule is kind of 
uh, kind of takes that into account. So here are the other things we have to realize, uh, the other things we want to note is that the force, uh, the force a charge will feel from a magnetic field is gonna be biggest when the velocity is perpendicular to B. So the case where they're both, uh, if B, if, so if the charge is not moving, and it's in a magnetic field, there's no magnetic force. So that's case one. The other thing, uh, case two, is if we're moving, but we're moving parallel to the field. So if the velocity and the magnetic field are in the same direction, like shown here, we also have no magnetic force. It's only when there's an angle between B and V that we have this perpendicular force. And if that angle is 90 degrees, that force is biggest. So we need our force law describing these force, this force to uh, contain all of these properties. So our first bit of theory on the next slide gets all of these uh, properties in one model equation. So this is our first uh, equation for the day. This is for the magnitude of a magnetic force. So as we'll see, it depends on the magnitude of the charge that we have, how big its velocity is, how big the magnetic field is, and also that angle. And we use the sine of the angle because sine is biggest when the angle is 90 degrees, smallest when the angle is zero. So sine of zero will make sure if our angle is zero, that's sine of the angle. The angle here is alpha. That's the angle between the magnetic field and the velocity vector. If that's zero, it makes the force zero. If that's 90, it gives us the biggest possible value of the force, which that biggest possible value is given by all of this stuff. So the other quantities here, so noticing just like kind of summarizing what I just said out loud, if alpha is zero, it makes the force zero. So if we have a velocity parallel to the magnetic field, we have no magnetic force. The total direction of the force can be given by a new type of right-hand rule, which I have pictured here. It's gonna be the second type of right-hand rule, and today we're gonna to have a lot of practice with this one. So this is the right-hand rule for uh, computing the direction of a magnetic force if you know the velocity of a charge, or equivalently, the direction of a current, and the magnetic field. So if you kind of take your, your hand and you use your thumb, index, and middle finger, and you make them kind of into this uh, gun-type shape, So you take your, your thumb, index, and middle finger and make them all at right angles to each other, as shown here. Your thumb represents the velocity, your index finger represents the magnetic field, and your middle finger represents the force. So if you know two of these, you could find the direction of the third by aligning your fingers along the directions of the things you know. So for instance here, if I know the velocity and magnetic field, I can align my thumb and index finger, and the direction my middle finger points gives the force. Alternatively, if I know the direction of the force and the magnetic field, I can find the direction the charge must be moving by aligning my middle finger and index finger to the force and the magnetic field, and then however my thumb points will give me the direction of the velocity. Again, this is something that's hard to do online, but hopefully that gives you the, uh, the idea of how this works. Uh, your palm, you should place your kind of palm of your hand right where the charge is. That's why that big plus sign is there. So again, as with the other right-hand rule we had, negative charges follow the reverse rule. So if you want the force on a negative charge that's moving, in a magnetic field. Uh, you find the way your middle finger points and then take the opposite direction. So uh, a negative charge 
uh, follows the opposite result of the right hand rule. Alternatively, if you have a negative charge, you could use your left hand to get the direction of the force. Uh, but I like just sticking with one right hand rule and then just reversing the result for a negative charge. As with, uh, as with our previous right hand rule for determining the direction of the creative magnetic field, this right hand rule I think is best learned with practice. So I have a few problems for you guys. So I'm going to take this diagram, the direction, the right hand rule diagram, and it'll be on the next slide so you can reference it. Uh, so for today, what we're going to do is uh, we'll look at a few problems finding the direction of a magnetic force, and then a problem or two looking at finding the magnitude. So uh, some right-hand rule problems and then some practice using this force formula to get the magnitude. So first one for you is here. So we have a proton and it's moving as shown in, in the magnetic field created by this bar magnet. What is the direction of the force? So take a little bit and think about it. Practice with the right hand rule. Actually, uh, I meant to have uh, the right hand rule picture on this slide, but for some reason it didn't save. So let's go back to it. So does everyone have this, anyone not have this rule copied down that you can reference it? All right, I'm gonna assume no, no uh, comments that everyone does have it copied down. So let's take this and then apply it to this problem. You of course may have seen the answer when I went out of full screen view, but try to pretend you didn't. So as a tip here, velocity is the direction of your thumb. So using this right hand rule, your thumb has to point up. Your index finger is the magnetic field, which are, as far as diagrams from our book are concerned, are always uh, in blue. So we need the direction of the magnetic field at the point where the charge is. So this is gonna be your index finger. So to get the force on the proton, that will be the direction of your middle finger if you align your thumb and index finger on your right hand.
All right, well, we're going to have to try another one, but say the answer here is D. But let's take a look. So I'm going to take this diagram here and copy and paste it onto our slide so we can compare. So in order in order here for the right hand rule to work, you have to have your velocity, your thumb, your index finger, and your force on the in this right angle configuration. So your middle finger as the force, index finger as the magnetic field, thumb as the velocity. But they have to be kind of in this configuration where they're each, each of your fingers are at a right angle to each other. So if you could take the diagram that you have pictured here and think about translating it so that your thumb points along the velocity. So like take your hand as it's in the configuration here. So your thumb's gonna be the velocity and rotate your hand. So your thumb in this, when your hand is kept in this shape, rotate it so your thumb points along the velocity in this diagram. That'll rotate all of the other fingers. As you rotate your thumb, your index finger here should rotate to be along the direction of the magnetic field at this point. That should leave your middle finger, which is the force pointing out of the page, which is why we have D as the answer. So I know this is confusing and tough to kind of do online, but a few of your problems are going to involve doing this. So I want to do some practice before we move on. So we're gonna try another one here. Uh, and let's see if we can, let's see if we can think through that one. I have a few options, so let me see. The next one I have is for a, mag, uh, for a negative charge, which is the other option here. So, here I give you the velocity and the force. So I give you your thumb and your middle finger. So here your thumb is in the direction of velocity. Your middle finger is the force which points out of the page. What direction of the magnetic field, i.e. your index finger, will give you this force. So let's try one problem where we find the strength of a magnetic force and there's a good kind of uh, application here that I want to talk about. So if you kind of look at this situation here, we have now the magnetic field pointing into the page, meaning kind of away from our faces. And we give a little a positive charge a kick in the downward direction. Since the force is always perpendicular to the velocity, 
Magnetic forces tend to make charged particles move in circles. And if the magnetic field is uniform in strength and direction, it can be perfect uniform circular motion. So the magnetic force always acts like a centripetal force. So if we take the strength of the magnetic force, it has to follow uh, a centripetal force law, meaning the mass of the charged particle times its velocity squared uh, divided by the radius of the circular path it makes also should give us the strength of the magnetic force. So this type of motion is particularly uh, important for a few things. Uh, one is generally how particle accelerators work from a physics standpoint, using magnetic fields to cause particles to move in a circle and speed up. Uh, and this type of motion is called cyclotron motion after a uh, old fashioned word for particle accelerators. Uh, but in particular, we see this in nature a lot with charged particles that are hitting the Earth's atmosphere. And also the fundamental principles of this circular motion are how mass spectrometers work. So the problem, the kind of quantitative problem I wanna to do today involves looking at this situation. So we could take our magnetic force law from before for the strength of the force. Charge times velocity times the magnetic field times the sine of the angle alpha. Here, this angle, in this type of situation, this angle is always 90 degrees. So sine of 90 is one. So that simplifies this, our formula a bit. So if we have this situation where we're moving in perfect circular motion in a uniform magnetic field, alpha is always going to be 90. And this formula simplifies like so. If we know the charge of our particle and how fast it's moving and the magnetic field it's in, we could find the radius of this circle that's moving. More applicable, however, is if we didn't know the charge or the mass, we might be able to use these other quantities. For instance, if we could get a particle moving in a circle in a magnetic field and measure the radius of that circle, it might allow us to solve for the charge, the unknown charge or the unknown mass. So often the formula rearranged this way is the way it's most useful. Notice here that solving for the radius, bring the radius over to this side, bring charge down into the denominator and the magnetic field down in the denominator, one factor of velocity cancels. So, Basically, the experiment involves setting up this uniform magnetic field, taking the velocity and the force, setting them equal to each other using the laws of circular motion. It allows it, and if we can measure this radius, it allows us to get a measure of the mass of a particle or the charge of a particle, or the ratio in particular. The magnetic field and the velocity are things that we could measure experimentally. What this allows us to do is measure properties of charged particles. So for instance, we've worked a lot with these numbers for charges of the electron and uh, mass of the electron. And this type of experiment is how we know these numbers. Uh, so for instance, to get the charge of the electron, we didn't talk about this earlier, that was, the charge was originally measured by Robert Millikan, who did this oil drop experiment, which if you studied, you may have studied in chemistry classes at some point. Basically, the idea was Robert Millikan charged all these drops of oil that were suspended in air, put them in an electric field and got them to levitate and use that to measure the charge of the electrons on the oil droplets. It's actually kind of very similar to our balloon experiment in some ways, uh, though more obviously more accurate and a bit more uh, systematic. You may have also heard that J.J. Thompson discovered that 
discovered the electron, but in particular, quantitatively what he did is he measured the ratio of the charge to mass, so the charge divided by the mass. And he did that by actually setting up this cyclotron motion experiment. This is a more modern picture of such an experiment. So here you can see over kind of on this part of the device, there's effectively a capacitor set up. And behind it, there's a source of electrons. The capacitor setup is used to accelerate the electrons, which are then shot out into this vacuum tube. So this blue beam you see here are all these generated electrons. There are some wire coils that go around these dark loops so you can't see them here, but they create a known uniform magnetic field. And that magnetic field points perpendicular to the screen, so into and out of the screen, either or. So here I'm going to draw them. Magnetic field vectors is pointing into the screen, like that. Kind of going and just uh, doing that now, so you can see. Uh, getting rid of my drawing, so you can see kind of what else is here. Uh, the electron beam then, because of that field, bends. So it starts moving in this circular orbit path. And that radius of the circle that this makes can effectively be measured. You can imagine putting a screen behind this tube, tracing out the path, and then finding out what circle it makes. What that allows us to do is then use this cyclotron force equation, so the centripetal motion equation set equal to the force for a magnetic field equation, and solve for the ratio of electric charge to mass. So this doesn't tell us the charge or mass separately, but by combining this result with Millikan's oil drop experiment. So Millikan measured the charge of the electron, the number, the 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. JJ Thompson here measured the charge to mass ratio. So that allows us to really solve for the mass which is really Thompson, the mass of an electron. So this really, really small number, and including uh, not just electrons, but protons, other subatomic particles, all of their masses and how we know them are from experiments like this. And this is generally why it's important to at least see and talk about this type of magnetic motion uh, at least once or twice in a physics class. Basically, what is happening here is kind of a very, very fundamental and uh, primitive version of a mass spectrometry experiment. So mass spectrometers, even today, work by sending charged particles into a ma magnetic field and causing them to move in a circular path. And then by changing the magnetic field you have, you can determine uh, what the mass of the particles must be because the mass will determine what circle they will make in a given magnetic field. So uh, I'm going to have you guys work through one problem that's very similar uh, with these equations before we go. And most of your homework problems relate to this type of problem, a cyclotron motion problem. Uh, but before we do that example problem together, uh, I just want to also say that more or less this, where this type of motion is seen in nature is in the auroras. So charged particles that are flying at the Earth from the sun hit the Earth's magnetic field and then immediately start to circle, make follow circular paths around the magnetic field. It's not a uniform circle that stays in one plane as in our example. It's more of like a helix 
But still, the magnetic field of the Earth tends to cause this circular motion for charged particles that have a velocity. That ends up directing all of the charged particles towards the poles of the planet. So at the North and South Pole, it's why you have this effect of the aurora borealis, or in the Southern Hemisphere, the aurora, aurora australis. Uh, they have different names, but in the Northern Hemisphere, it's the aurora borealis, the Northern Lights. So if you are in the Northern Hemisphere, or very far north in, uh, in the winter when the sky is dark, you can see this effect. Uh, these are both pictures from different places in Alaska of the Northern Lights. Uh, but just the connection here is that they are all caused by cyclotron motion, magnetic forces causing particles to move in circular paths. So we have here our connection to the history of science with J.J. Thompson discovering and measuring the mass of the electron, or the charge to mass ratio, and our connection to natural phenomenon, which is the northern lights. So before we finish now, uh, where we can, one last example before we get to the problem then is a connection to technology. So where this is used, where this effect is used uh, in uh, technology these days is really to uh, create radioactive isotopes. Uh, more or less you create radioactive isotopes by taking source of protons or other very fast moving particles and collide them with some non-radioactive isotope to make it radioactive. In order to get that high speed beam of particles, whether they be protons or electrons, you need to speed them up. And using this magnetic cyclotron motion effect is one way to do that. Uh, most uh, particle accelerators create a source of uh, magnetic field to keep particles moving in a circle. And then there's also this separated, separated plates of charge to cause the particles to accelerate as they pass from one section of the device to another. This is actually a very simple, small, condensed version of a particle accelerator. And you usually have these devices uh, Often a lot of uh, hospitals will have a device like this to create a small particle accelerated beam to create isotopes for medical imaging. So magnetic field in this case would kind of point upward. A source of protons would be at the center and then they would be released with a small velocity. The voltage across the two ends of these plates will speed them up the magnetic field would constantly turn them, they'd accelerate, and as they speed up, the circle they move in gets bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually they get to the output of the device. And at which point they move off at a uniform velocity in a, uh, in a straight line after they leave the magnetic field. So the thing you wanted to make radioactive, you would place kind of right here. So the protons hit it. In order to, uh, the voltage on the plates has to switch back and forth frequently. So it causes the particles always to accelerate when it cost, crosses the gap. That's the only kind of difference from our standard capacitor, uh, capacitor setup. The voltage switches back and forth. So it's always accelerating the particles that are moving across one plate to another. Last thing that's worth noting is that in these devices, engineers call the two plates that are involved in this circular particle accelerator Ds because they look like the letter D. Kind of a very un, uh, uninteresting name and uncreative name. So as kind of an animation of what this looks like,
your proton speeds up. As it speeds up, it makes a bigger, bigger circle. And the, two, the charge on the two plates switches back and, back and forth, so it's always accelerating the proton when it crosses the gaps. And then when it hits the edge, it leaves and escapes. All right, so our uh, example quantitative problem today relates to one of these devices. So here, we're given a few different numbers, and I'm going to convert uh, some numbers here for you. But here we're giving a magnetic field and a kinetic energy, which I'm going to convert to a velocity. It's given in some weird units here, but it's the units people actually, people tend to use in these devices. So the goal here for this device is we want to accelerate a proton to a certain speed, which we'll compute in a second. And have that proton hit an oxygen nuclei to turn it into a radioactive fluorine nuclei. And the magnetic field that we use to cause the circular motion is 1.2 Tesla. And we wanna compute what the radius of the proton's orbit is right before it leaves the cyclotron. So given a certain speed, what will be the radius? So this basically goes back to the cyclotron force equation solved for the radius that we had on the other slide. But we need a speed. So this number here is a kinetic energy which I'm going to convert to joules for you and then give you the speed since we're uh, running low on time here. So give me one second and I will get that to you. All right, so in the chat, I've sent you the speed that this kinetic energy corresponds to. It's uh, about five times 10 to the seven meters per second. And the mass of the proton is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27. And that's in kilograms. The charge of the proton is the same as the charge of the electron. So we'll leave it if you guys want to hang out and compute the answer here and check it with me. You can. I'm going to put up the computation, the answer on the slide, but those of you that want to hang out and check and you know go through your work and wait if you might have questions for me can say. Those of you that don't can uh, can feel free to leave. 
all of the problems for today, uh, for today's homework, all involve this circular motion type law. So they're all going to relate to charged particles moving in circles in magnetic fields. The charge uh, is the same as the charge of the electron, just positive. So times 10 to the minus 19, 1 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Just sent it there in the chat. So if you want to compute an answer for R, I will hang out and wait. Uh, if you feel confident in the calculation, uh, you can feel free to head out, and I will talk to you on Friday. <laughs>